Selamu aleyküm. Selamu aleyküm. Selamu aleyküm. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome, welcome. How are you? الحمد لله. It's doing well. Wonderful. جزاك الله خير. Well, let me begin by saying بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I'd like to begin uh, in the name of Allah and welcome you to our class, Anthropology of Islam. It is uh, offered as ITKI 6205 by the IKI Academy, Institute of Knowledge Integration. And we are honored and blessed to have all of you wonderful students uh, joining us. Uh, today is uh, August 13th, 2022, which means that in addition to this class, we have only two more classes left until the end of this uh, trimester, this summer trimester uh, for our course. Uh, it has been a year since IKI Academy was established, and alhamdulillah, we have uh, been truly blessed by uh, all of the great students uh, who have uh, joined us and participated and contributed uh, to our uh, humble effort to extend knowledge about Islamic civilization and to make people aware of our uh, Islamic heritage and Islamic thought and Islamic ideas. Uh, as you know, the research paper is due uh, the last day of class, which is 27 August. Uh, but please let me know uh, if you have any difficulties or if you are facing any problems. I hope you can finish it quickly and soon so that this requirement is taken care of and you not, do not have to rush uh, at the end of the semester to complete it uh, in order to submit it. Uh, and I am waiting uh, to uh, hear from you if you have any questions or any uh, matters that you would like to discuss. Uh, we also are uh, requesting uh, through Dr. Elmira, uh, she needs to know all of your names like in your passport. So thank you for those who have provided it and hopefully uh, the rest of you will uh, provide it as soon as uh, possible. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for that uh, and also uh, thank you for all of you who have been providing me uh, with your assignments, all four assignments. I am very uh, honored and blessed to uh, be uh, your teacher, uh, to be your professor, uh, and to share with you what little knowledge I have, and to hear from you, uh, and to benefit from all the great knowledge that all of you have, uh, and to share in this uh, effort of intellectual dialogue and discussion. Uh, the uh, course, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, has covered the ideas of Dr. Ismail Raji Al-Faruqi and his wife Lois Lamia Al-Faruqi. Today I want to touch upon the ideas of Dr. Taha Alwani. Uh, we had sent you through the uh, Telegram group the PDF of uh, the book of Dr. Alwani on Ijtihad. So uh, please continue to read it uh, and to uh, think about uh, his ideas uh, and to share in class uh, what you uh, have understood uh, from him and what you agree or disagree with him. Uh, so let me begin uh, with uh, the uh, 
mention of Dr. Taha by saying that he was uh, born in Iraq uh, and he uh, completed uh, his education in the beginning in Iraq uh, but then he went to Egypt uh, to Al-Azhar University and completed his PhD there. So he uh, has been trained by many scholars in Iraq uh, and in Egypt uh, and he later worked uh, as a professor in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he gained a tremendous amount of knowledge in uh, the Islamic sciences, particularly fiqh, jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh, the roots of jurisprudence uh, in sharia, in Islamic law, and in uh, the uh, variety of other Islamic sciences. He was a, a true scholar uh, in, in many different ways, uh, very well-rounded, and later on, uh, when the International Institute of Islamic Thought was established in the United States in 1981, uh, he uh, was able to move from Saudi Arabia to the United States and continue his contributions to the revival of the Ummah and to the betterment of the Muslim community. Uh, from the point of view of anthropology of Islam, uh, Dr. Taha was very keen uh, Muslims realizing uh, their community connections uh, and to uh, keep uh, their uh, social ties as strong as possible to their uh, family, to their neighborhoods, to their uh, community, to their mosque, uh, to the ummah. Uh, and this uh, is uh, extremely important in the area of anthropology. Uh, because there are so many challenges to maintaining our connections. And as I had asked you in assignment number four to write the paper regarding uh, relating uh, the Day of Judgment uh, to our community ties and how important it is when we realize that we will be held accountable, uh, that this is something motivating us to fulfill our responsibilities and our responsibilities toward our uh, family and community are essential and uh, incredibly important, particularly within the uh, family unit. Uh, so uh, he, uh, Dr. Taha was uh, very much uh, a leader, uh, a leader in the arena of uh, intellect and ideas. Uh, he was uh, fighting against radicalism and extremism uh, and fundamentalism in, in the Muslim community on the one hand, and he was also uh, trying to show uh, the issues and the problems when uh, Muslims go in the opposite direction and leave Islam or Islam simply becomes a very uh, diminished part of their lives as a result of being affected by uh, ideas of the uh, um, modernist movement or the uh, ultra-secularist uh, movement or the uh, movement uh, toward uh, abandoning religion and trying to make everything uh, subject to uh, the limitations of human intellect and denying any role for uh, revelation uh, and salvation uh, by Allah. So you have these two extremes, uh, rejecting Islam or going into a very uh, misguided and uh, very uh, radical uh, type of Islam. In the middle is what in Arabic we call wasatiya, moderation. Uh, the middle path uh, in uh, Surah Al-Fatiha talks about as-sirat al-mustaqim, the correct path. So it doesn't have extremes, it's aware of what is right and wrong and it tries to establish uh, a, uh, a religious uh, effort uh, that is based upon the Quran and Sunnah that is neither too weak nor uh, overly uh, controlling and domineering and dictatorial. Uh, and this is uh, essential for our psychology and for our spiritual health uh, and our uh, social connections. Uh, is it easy to follow wasatiyah? Uh, in today's world, it's hard to, to be moderate because there's so many things pulling us toward uh, the extremes, either to leave Islam or to weaken Islam or to make Islam 
uh, too uh, rigid uh, and too unthinking uh, and too much uh, uh, blindly following what uh, the scholars uh, tell you. So uh, in the case, for example, of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Daesh uh, and Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, uh, they are so overly focused on the uh, Muslim uh, effort to only uh, save Muslims and to prevent Muslims from making any mistake that they create dictatorships. A dictatorship forces you to follow what they think is right, uh, so it is like a prison. Uh, they keep you alive, but only in order to uh, be uh, a controlled uh, human being, to be completely under the uh, control of whoever is in power. And as we know from the Quran and Sunnah, this is completely unacceptable. Only Allah is allowed to decide for us ultimately what should govern everything in our life. Uh, if uh, there are organizations or entities that, uh, like Dr. Taha was pointing out, that help us become better Muslims and follow Allah better, that's good, but without force. Uh, it's very clear in the Quran when it says, لا إكراه في الدين, there is no force in religion. That means you must follow Islam voluntarily. Anybody who forces you to pray or forces you to go to Hajj or forces you to pay zakat, they are doing something completely wrong and haram. And also your own uh, Islamic uh, behavior is rejected because it's not being done with a good niyyah uh, voluntarily, but rather you are being forced to do it. And when you are forced to do something good like prayer or like fasting, then it's not counted by Allah. It has to be something you choose to do, and you decide to do, and you make the right intention, the right niyyah, to do it for the sake of Allah, and not because there is uh, some entity that is forcing you to do it, especially when that entity is uh, the government and the people in power. Now, how do we follow this middle path that Dr. Taha was advocating that Dr. Taha Jabir Alwani was promoting, that Dr. Taha Jabir Alwani was uh, writing about. Uh, part of it has to do with community, maintaining your community ties so that your family and your neighbors and your friends uh, are all part of the same process, reinforcing each other, hand in hand, working together to make us, to help us, to guide us, to uh, push us to do what is right uh, voluntarily without any government uh, forcing us uh, to do something or any dictatorship uh, deciding for us what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> Another issue that uh, Dr. Taha looked at was the uh, jurisprudence of minorities or what is called fiqh of minorities. He, he looked at the Muslim communities uh, that are minorities in non-Muslim countries, and he realized, like many others, that they face issues that maybe not every Muslim community faces, especially the Muslims in Muslim-majority countries face, and he tried to find as many solutions to some of the issues that minority Muslims face. So, for example, if uh, a Christian family, husband, wife, children, uh, are uh, in a situation where, let's say, the wife becomes Muslim. Now, the traditional Islamic approach was that only a Muslim male can marry a non-Muslim female. A Muslim female cannot marry a non-Muslim male. Uh, but in, in the case of the United States and many other uh, non-Muslim countries, a lot of uh, women want to become Muslim, but they are married to a non-Muslim. So how is that going to work out? So Dr. Taha, after doing a lot of study, along with other scholars, realized that if you tell this Muslim woman she has to divorce her non-Muslim uh, husband, this will destroy the family. Uh, this will make her life miserable. She may end up being uh, bankrupt or homeless and unable to take care of her family and herself. So uh, it's better to keep the family intact, even though she stays married to a non-Muslim, of course, trying to help uh, her husband become Muslim. But even if he doesn't, uh, as long as he lets her uh, practice Islam uh, and teach it to her kids, 
then uh, this is not uh, the best situation, but it is better than uh, telling her that she has to divorce. So this is one of many issues uh, that is dealt with in the uh, fiqh of minorities, uh, where uh, all kinds of interesting issues uh, come up. Now, what also happens when Muslims are a minority, but also when Muslims are a majority, is the issue of uh, how do we take care of each other and who's responsible for what, uh, and what is happening uh, to uh, address the needs of the community. So every community has people who are poor, people who are sick, uh, people who are criminals, uh, people who are uh, uneducated, uh, people who are refugees uh, or migrants or immigrants or emigrants. So uh, these and many other issues involving human beings can affect uh, Muslim communities around the world. In the anthropology of Islam, we try to understand how different communities can maintain uh, their values and their uh, different uh, Islamic orientations uh, and their Islamic beliefs uh, and uh, address all the issues that uh, the community is facing. Sometimes we make mistakes. So, for example, if you look at uh, a traditional tribe or small village, uh, in the tribe, the tribe takes care of everything for you if you are a member of that tribe. And in return, you have complete loyalty to the tribe. You do whatever the tribe tells you to do, whether you like it or not. So you sacrifice for the tribe, and the tribe, uh, uh, in turn, uh, takes care of everything you need. Your job, your health, your education, your training, uh, your spiritual needs, your economic needs. Everything is taken care of by the tribe. What some Muslims do, unfortunately, and also non-Muslims, is they say, you see, uh, this is how the tribe functions, then we have to do it uh, the same way when there is a government. So when we are no longer talking about the small level of the tribe, we're talking about uh, the uh, level of the government of an entire country, uh, they then transfer the same idea of uh, the tribe taking care of its tribal members into the government taking care of every citizen, which is a big mistake, uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of many scholars, uh, including Dr. Taha. Uh, Islam focuses on individual responsibility uh, and the requirement that you fulfill the basic uh, commandments and tenets of Islam yourself. You don't push it and uh, blame it on somebody else or uh, make it the responsibility of something somebody else. Uh, and what do I mean by this? For example, prayer. I cannot say, oh, I don't feel like praying today. Let me ask my brother to pray instead of me. So the thought of prayers, the required prayers, you have to do it, whether you like it or not. If you're sick, if you're uh, hungry, uh, if you are uh, uh, outside the house, doesn't matter, you still have to do it, but uh, the Qur'an makes it very clear that if it's difficult for you to stand up or uh, to do the movements, then you can do it uh, in a way that you are still able to. Uh, so you can sit down and pray. If, if you're on an airplane, you do it in your airplane seat. Uh, you don't stand up, you don't make sujood and the ruku'ah. You just do it while sitting. And uh, this is acceptable in the eyes of Allah if you cannot do it completely. So it's not an excuse not to do it or to delay it. You do it anyway. If, uh, God forbid, you are sick in the hospital and you cannot even move anything, you do it with your eyes. You pray uh, without any movement, but you still pray and you try to, uh, and you do it on time. So prayer, like other Muslim uh, duties and requirements and responsibilities, you cannot ask somebody to do it for you. Zakat. You have to pay the 2.5% requirement to uh, those in need out of your income. And you cannot say, oh, I'm not going to pay it. Let my uh, dad pay it or let my boss pay it. No, it's your responsibility. Now, you could uh, get advice from other people over uh, uh, the best way to uh, distribute it. That's fine. Uh, same thing with uh, Hajj. 
you are required as a Muslim to do it once in your life. Uh, you cannot shift that responsibility. Now, somebody who is doing Hajj can do it on uh, the behalf of somebody else who has passed away uh, or uh, is uh, somebody they love and cherish. But you as an individual, if you can do Hajj, you are required to do it. Okay. So uh, the basic principle then is Islam is based upon individual responsibility. And this is not just in terms of the rituals. When it comes to uh, taking care of your parents, taking care of your neighbors, uh, helping out uh, the needy in the community, it's still our responsibility. If we want to be lazy and we say, oh, just let the government take care of them, not acceptable in Islam. It's not the government's job and it's not the government's responsibility to take over your responsibility. Even if it is a big problem, even if there are millions and millions of poor people, obviously you cannot take care of all of them, but uh, with zakat, you can take care of some of them, and then you can work with other community members and with charitable organizations to try to find out, to understand what is causing uh, the poverty and address it from its sources, from its roots, not just uh, the symptoms, uh, not just the uh, outer parts. Uh, so, for example, uh, many studies have shown that you're not going to solve poverty by just continually giving money to poor people. That does not solve uh, the problem of being poor. The issue with being poor is there are there's something causing people to be poor. There's a reason why people are poor. Uh, not having money is just a symptom of uh, of being poor. It's like if you go to the doctor and you say, my stomach hurts, uh, and the doctor gives you some uh, painkiller, that painkiller is just a, addressing the symptom, the, the feeling of having pain. But it's not addressing the cause. Maybe you are having stomach pain because you are eating terrible food, processed food, unhealthy food, uh, fast food, greasy food, okay? Uh, so that's the cause. So rather than going with uh, pills and uh, medicine and the uh, prescriptions, you have to change what is causing your stomach problem from the source, from the beginning, from the cause. Stop eating bad food. Stop eating unhealthy food. Stop eating processed food. That's the real solution. So we as Muslims are uh, required by Allah to use our brains uh, to use our intelligence to figure out what's the real problem, the cause of the problem, and then to work together to solve it so that it doesn't continue forever. What you have now is governments around the world, uh, many of them give money to poor people, but rather than solving poverty, it's increasing. So, for example, since the 1960s, the U.S. government has spent every year billions of dollars uh, giving money to poor people, uh, what has happened since uh, 1960? Instead of going down, the number of poor people has increased. So the government uh, involvement did not solve the problem. Actually, it is contributing to increasing poverty. And these problems, like uh, Dr. Taha ha have pointed out, that exist in Muslim and non-Muslim communities, cannot be solved by the government and should not be solved by the government. It is our responsibility as a community, as uh, Muslims, as human beings, to address the needs of our fellow Muslims and our fellow human beings. So it is like we are the tribe. Don't blame or put the, push the responsibility to the government. Take the position as if, uh, as uh, we learn in anthropology, we are a community, we are a group, we are a village, we are a tribe. We take care of each other without the government uh, involvement. Now, if you talk to a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, they seem to feel uh, that uh, whenever there's a problem, it's the, pro it's the responsibility of the government to solve it, whether it's terrorism or extremism or uh, refugees or uh, the... Uh, problems with uh, food uh, getting uh, delivered to uh, people who are hungry or famine 
whatever the problem is, a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, will say, oh, uh, yeah, the government should deal with that, the government would solve it, there should be uh, social services, there should be a social safety net, there should be welfare, there should be programs uh, for the poor and the needy and the sick and the uneducated. So government should uh, provide schools, government should provide hospitals, government should provide roads, government should provide uh, food, government should provide uh, the help for the older people uh, who are uh, very weak and uh, cannot work anymore. Uh, government should provide income for people who are retired. All of these things, many people, uh, especially Muslims, uh, have the idea or the position that the government should take care of all these problems. Where did this idea come from? Uh, as Dr. Taha tells us, look at the Quran and Sunnah and find out, is that what it says or does it say something else? Is there anywhere in the Quran that says, whenever there's a problem, tell the government to solve it? Answer, no. You can correct me if I'm wrong because I am a human being. I make mistakes. Sometimes I say wrong things. Sometimes I say correct things. So tell me, is there any verse in the Quran that says, whenever there's a problem, tell the government to solve it? Not a single verse. In fact, there are many verses in the Quran that say, whenever there's a problem, you solve it. You take care of it. You help. You can do it through zakat. You can do it through sadaqa, which is charity. Okay, you can do it through uh, helping out physically yourself. You can do it through writing. You can do it through speaking. Anything it takes to solve a problem, the Quran supports. But never does the Quran say depend on the government. Same thing with a uh, hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, the seerah, the history of the Prophet Muhammad. He did not tell Muslims, uh, wait for the government to solve all your problems. Never. Ah, yes, Rafiq, uh, he's mentioning communal responsibility. So in anthropology, when we talk about communi communal responsibility, that means the community is responsible for solving its problems, not the government. Now, some people say, well, I mean, look at the prophet. He, uh, he helped poor people. Yes, he did. But he did that as a prophet, not as a government leader. You see? So the prophet, peace be upon him, had different roles. He was a father, he was a husband, he was a prophet, he was a community leader, he was a judge, he was a government leader. Uh, so many different roles. Sometimes they overlapped, but they are different roles. So when the government, uh, when the prophet, peace be upon him, helped poor people, he did it out of his own money. And a lot of times he didn't have that much food, but he still shared it with poor people. He would share some dates, sometimes even half a date. Uh, when he cooked, he would invite some poor people over many times. So he tried to help as a person, as a Muslim, as a responsible human being, not as a government leader. So we have to be very careful and very uh, aware of this. Now, just because somebody after the Prophet, who was a Muslim leader, took money from people or stole land, uh, that doesn't mean that that is right. Uh, even though they did it to uh, try to help uh, people in need. Uh, Brother Rafiq is pointing out the Quran instructs against concentration of wealth in some hands. Uh, zakat and charity are the mechanisms uh, to stop the concentration of wealth. Yes, that's a good point. Concentration of wealth is a very interesting type of situation. What do we mean by concentration of wealth? You see, some people confuse concentration of wealth, make it a problem, and think it's a matter of uh, the existence of rich people. So there are some people who are Muslim, and even some non-Muslims, who think uh, being rich is a problem, or rich people are a problem, or why do they have so much money? Uh, many people ask me, why do these rich people have so much money? And my response is, and the response of many scholars is, including Dr. Taha, what is your problem with rich people? Uh, Yes, exactly, Brother Habib. Uh, this is a verse from the Quran that talks about how wealth should not be restricted and constricted uh, just to the rich. So 
if a rich person is stealing and lying and hurting people, uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, yes. Uh, so uh, when rich people are committing crimes, that is a problem. If they got rich because they put a huge amount of trash and pollution into the river and the ocean uh, and the lakes and the streams, this is a crime. Uh, and if they got rich by making crimes, that crime is haram, that crime is wrong. You should not become rich by stealing from other people and hurting other people like the mafia and the criminal gangs. Uh, this is haram. This is completely unacceptable. But I'm talking about just being rich by itself. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Islam never said bad things about rich people. Islam criticized the bad behavior of rich people if they did bad behavior. So when we look in the Quran about the great story of uh, Qarun, okay, uh, Qarun was a very rich man at the time of the pharaohs, at the time of Pharaoh, uh, at the time of uh, Egyptian civilization uh, in the past. So Qarun, according to the Quran, had so much money, so much wealth uh, that he had to store it in big uh, vaults, in big storage areas, and just the keys for these storage areas filled boxes and boxes and boxes that were difficult uh, for many men to carry. So what was the problem of Qarun? Not that he was rich in and of itself. The problem of Qarun is he did not help anybody and he only wanted to accumulate money for the sake of money, not for the sake of pleasing Allah or making life better for other people or being a good human being. He did not care about anybody except himself. He did not care about helping the environment. He did not care about uh, making the government better. He did not care about the community. He just wanted more and more wealth, way more than he could ever spend in his whole life. That was the problem with Qaru. And so with any rich person, the question is not whether you are rich or poor. The question is, did you become rich in a halal way or a haram way? Did you do it? within the law or did you lie cheat and steal and murder and kill and destroy other people to become rich so that's the first part how you got the money and then when it comes to what you do with the money are you spending it in halal ways are you spending it to support yourself and your family and your community uh, and helping address uh, different needs or are you wasting or misspending or using it for bribery or using your money to hurt people. So it's the usage, it's the behavior, it's not the condition of being rich or not. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu encouraged us to work hard and to be industrious, to produce, to be positive contributing members of our economy and our society, which meant the harder you worked uh, while fulfilling your responsibility, that's a good thing. And if the result is Allah blesses you, and gives you rizq, gives you uh, wealth, that's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. You see, unlike in uh, medieval Catholic Christianity uh, in Europe, the priests talked about how rich people are bad people and they will never go to heaven, and that that is a, a terrible thing. They criticized people becoming rich, and to, they told the poor farmers, don't worry about becoming uh better uh, in your income don't worry about increasing your income don't worry about improving your income just be humble stay where you are and if you have any extra money you give it to the church that's what the catholic church was preaching in the middle ages uh, to the uh, people in europe whereas in islam we never had this the prophet muhammad وسلم, always said uh, be hard working be a good producer uh make sure that you are taking care of your family increase your wealth in a halal way and spend it in a halal way and the richer you are that's better not worse so what happens today when we have poverty and we have many poor people many muslims say and even non-muslims oh that's the government's problem government has to take care of them government has to give them money Government has to spend on them. Government has to give them houses. Government has to give them food. Government has to pay for their education. Government has to pay for their uh, medical needs and, and hospitals. Many Muslims have this idea. 
Unfortunately, <clears throat> I call this idea, and other scholars, we call this idea socialism. What is socialism? Socialism is the economic system where the government controls everything, and then the government spends on everybody, takes care of everybody. So the government owns all the schools and the roads and the hospitals and the supermarkets and the factories and the farms. And then it takes all that and then gives a job to everybody, gives clothes to everybody, gives uh, housing to everybody, gives uh, free health care to everybody, free education to everybody, uh, takes care of the old people uh, when they cannot work anymore. So this is called socialism. It is an economic idea. It was proposed or uh, supported. The most famous person who supported it was a German uh, scholar called Karl Marx. Uh, he was the person associated with socialism in history. Uh, and uh, it was implemented in Germany uh, and then in many other parts of Europe and then in uh, Russia, which then became the Soviet Union. Uh, so the socialism that we are talking about is represented, for example, by uh, Hitler and the Nazi party. If you look at the word Nazi, if you have studied the history of Germany and World War II, you see there is a word Nazi, N-A-Z-I. What is Nazi? It actually stands for National, I'm putting this in the comments, National Socialism. They took the N-A from National and the Z-I from uh, Socialism, and they called themselves the party of the Nazi party, National Socialism. So they were socialists. Hitler and the Nazis in World War II wanted the government to control everything. And also the communists in the Soviet Union uh, from uh, World War I uh, until uh, it fell down in 1991. In, under communism, they followed the socialist economic system, which means the government owns everything. Uh, and then many, many countries followed this uh, economic idea of socialism. What was the result? Millions and millions and millions of people killed. Uh, dying of disease and famine and hunger uh, and also being killed by the government because they were against the socialist ideas, the destruction of massive amounts of uh, business people and their businesses and their properties, and unfortunately, uh, the decline, the underdevelopment, the backwardness of uh, most of the countries on earth is the result of socialism. But until today, now if you ask most Muslims, you say, uh, do you believe in socialism? They say, no, no, it's haram, it's bad, it's terrible. But then when you try to find out, okay, uh, what do you think is the role of government? What uh, should happen in society? Then they will give you socialist ideas. They say government has to take care of the poor, government has to take care of health care, government has to take care of education. That's socialism. Those are socialist ideas. So actually, you, you say when we ask you, are you socialist or do you believe in socialism, you say no. But then when we ask you, what is the role of government, you give us socialist ideas. So there's a contradiction in the minds of many Muslims. And they, uh, whether they realize it or not, they're taking the idea of a tribe and the tribe taking care of its tribal members and impose it on uh, the uh, entire country. So, Brother Ashraf, you are making a good point. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari is often called as the principal antecedent of Islamic socialism. Yes, so some Muslims who want to justify socialism, they go back to early Islamic history, to the time of Prophet Muhammad and people like Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, and say, you see, uh, the government took care of everything, government took care of poor people, government took care of housing, government took care of uh, many things. How do we respond to that? One way of responding to, to that, uh, whether we read Dr. Taha Alwani or Dr. Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman or Dr. Ismail Farouqi, is to say, look, the Prophet took care of poor people, yes. It wasn't the government taking care of poor people. Now, after him, maybe the government took care of poor people, yes, but it wasn't their job. They were violating what the Prophet did, not following what the Prophet did. 
Because like we said, the prophet had many roles. What he did as a prophet is different than what we did as the head of the government, as the leader of the Muslims. So we cannot justify socialism by saying, well, it's what happened at the time of the prophet. That wasn't socialism at the time of the prophet. Government wasn't doing these things, and the prophet never told us that the government should do these things. Now, he did, he, he was told in the Quran to collect sadaqa, and he sent Umar radiallahu anhu to collect sadaqa. That's charity. And he collected charity as the prophet, not as the head of government. And he sent Umar to collect charity not as a government uh, bureaucrat or functionary or government ministry, but as a companion who is doing a service to Muslims, uh, encouraging them and helping to collect charity voluntarily. Now, some people say, uh, for example, zakat, the poor do, is a tax. What is a tax? A tax is money you have to give to the government whether you like it or not. This is basically what tax is. Most countries on earth have what's called taxes. Uh, it's a, it's an uh, it's amount of money you have to pay every year uh, to the government. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree or like it or not. They just say, well, it's your responsibility as a citizen to pay taxes to the government. So what some Muslims say, you see zakat is a tax. You pay it to the government, and then the government gives it to poor people and those in need, Act, which is a socialist idea. In reality, if you look at Islam and you study the Quran and Sunnah, Quran never said that the zakat should be collected by the government and distributed by the government. And the Prophet never made it the job of the government to do that. He did it himself as a Prophet and then assigned other people voluntarily if they wanted to help. Because the Quran makes it very clear, we are responsible individually to pay zakat to the seven clearly identified categories in the Quran. Okay, there are seven types of people that you can pay zakat to. You pay it because it's your individual responsibility. You don't pay it to the government. It doesn't in the Quran say pay zakat to the government like a tax. It says pay it to these uh, seven categories of people. The poor, the needy, the indigent, the traveling, Okay, and one of the categories is this is a cat collector. So the person who uh, is willing to take on the responsibility of distributing zakat if you don't want to go or are unable to uh, transfer the money yourself, uh, then you can pay it to the zakat collector, which is uh, one of the categories of zakat. So it's already taken care of in the Quran, no government involvement. And when the Prophet implemented zakat, again, if the government wasn't involved. So how does this uh, help us understand uh, the uh, situation of uh, the Muslim community, and especially from the uh, point of view of anthropology? As we know in anthropology, there's a big emphasis on support, the community supporting each other, which is very important. The problem with the government is once it becomes a government responsibility, communities stop supporting each other. Individuals stop supporting other individuals. Families stop supporting other families. Groups stop supporting other groups. Why? Because it becomes a government responsibility. So before the government got involved, for example, in what's called charity or uh, social welfare in the United States, who took care of the poor people and the needy and the blind and the uh, orphans uh, and the uh, people who are refugees, who took care of them? It was charities, voluntary organizations, churches, community groups, relatives, neighbors, rich people. So all kinds of people took care of the people who were in need, not the government. And that was a very good and wonderful system. When the government got involved and people said, oh, it's not my responsibility now, it's the government's, the situation got much, much worse. So in the richest country on earth, which is the United States, we have uh, one of the highest prison populations on earth because of so much crime, and one of the highest poverty rates on earth because of so many poor people. Poor people are not poor because they don't have money. Not having money is a symptom. 
Poor people are poor because of various reasons. One reason is because the government prevents them from working. So a lot of poor people, for example, who want to sell something on the street, the government says, no, 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 you cannot sell on the street. Of course, there's something called relative poverty. Yes, Brother Rafia, but that's important. But a lot of poor people are poor because the government, for example, uh, doesn't recognize their property rights. So they, the land they live on uh, is not theirs, and the house they live in uh, is not recognized by the government. So this is another problem that leads to poverty. Uh, the government uh, stealing a lot of money and corruption and bribery, that also leads to a lot of poverty. Uh, when the government takes taxes, it destroys businesses, that leads to a lot of poverty. So there's so many reasons for poverty uh, that then uh, result in people who are unable to sustain themselves and they don't have enough income. But the solution is not to throw money at them. Solution is, long-term solution, is to address what is originally causing it. So when Dr. Taha call, uh, talked about issues in the Muslim community, religious issues, uh, financial issues, social issues, he always emphasized long-term solutions. Don't think of just solving it in a day or a week, no. Like the saying you may have heard, uh, don't give uh, a man a fish to eat, teach him how to fish, right? Then he can depend on himself. The point of zakat is not to just uh, make poor people live one more day. The point of zakat is to help them go out of poverty. But that requires coordination and study and effort and spending the zakat wisely so that the community supports its needy members and poor members to get them out of poverty, to make sure their children do not keep up the cycle of poverty. Because once a person becomes educated, they're much more likely to be able to get a job and much more uh, likely to not be poor. Once you have a job, usually you're probably not as poor. So educating the young people is a very good way of getting rid of poverty. So some people will say, well, that's such a huge task, it has to be done by the government. No. In Islamic civilization, it wasn't the government educating us. It was the masjids and the madrasa, the schools, and the waqf, the charities. It was a community responsibility, education. And that's why Muslims became the most educated people on earth. Now, in Muslim countries, government ministries spend billions of dollars on education, but we still have the worst education in the world. So it's not about money. It's about taking responsibility and definitely making sure that uh, the government is not involved. Of course, these are my opinions. I'm not telling you that this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I am simply sharing with you uh, my understanding of the Quran and Sunnah and my understanding of the great scholars like Dr. Taha and Dr. Abdul Hamid and Dr. Farooqi. Uh, you're welcome to criticize me or agree or disagree or have your own thoughts. But I want to thank you for uh, being in class and for uh, being uh, involved in our uh, effort to raise the level of education uh, among uh, students, uh, including uh, Muslim students from around the world. Uh, and hopefully, uh, as you go through the IKI Academy courses, uh, you will be able to have a comprehensive understanding of Islamic uh, civilization and the reasons that we were uh, the top civilization in the past and then uh, ways in which we can uh, encourage and help each other to uh, revive and renew uh, Islamic civilization uh, as soon as we can. Any questions or thoughts? Ah, Brother Ashraf? Yes, let's read what you wrote in Arabic. Uh, قَدِمَ عَلَيْنَا عَبْدَ بن عَوْفْ فأخ فأخ النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بينه وبين سعد بن ربيع الأنصاري فعرض عليه أن يناصفه أهله وماله فقال عبد الرحمن بارك الله في لك في أهلك ومالك دلني على السوق فربح شيئا من قط وسمن ثم تزوج امرأة على زنة نوات نوات من ذهب Excellent example of hadith that's talking about uh, the uh, time when the Muslims ran away from Mecca and went to Medina. So in this story, 
the uh, uh, there uh, is a person called Abdurrahman ibn Auf who became uh, the uh, uh, co uh, co uh, person who was uh, who was uh, made into the uh, cohabitant with uh, Saad ibn Rabi' uh, who was uh, from Medina uh, in order to have a place to live and uh, food to eat. Uh, so Saad ibn Rabi' who is from Medina said to uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf who is from Mecca, I'll give you half my money uh, and I'll divorce one of my wives uh, and let her marry you or you can marry one of my daughters. So Abdurrahman said, uh, ba uh, bless you. Uh, and may God uh, give you uh, bl uh, blessing in your uh, wealth and your family. Uh, it, but in fact, rather than doing that, uh, giving me uh, your family member or your money, uh, show me to the market. So he went to the market and he uh, started to trade and he was able to uh, make money off of some uh, food uh, and some uh, fat and then he uh, was able to marry uh, a woman uh, after uh, gaining a lot of uh, uh, gold. So this is, uh, right, an example of how we're not talking about any government intervention. Muslims helping Muslims, human beings helping human beings, uh, community helping uh, parts of uh, the community. No force, no violence. Uh, no uh, laws being forced upon you by the government, uh, no taxes being paid, uh, simply human beings getting along together socially and economically. They are trading, uh, they are doing business, they are buying and selling, they are getting married, uh, they are having families, and everybody supporting everybody without the government telling them what to do, how to do it, forcing them to do it, or preventing them uh, from doing it. May Allah bless you all. Thank you for uh, okay. joining me in this class. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, brother Abdurrahman Bashir, Abdurrahim. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a good uh, lecture. I want to commend you and I want to confess that uh, I really benefited from this uh, program. Yeah. Uh, another thing again that I learn today is that uh, socialism you know because there are some books that i've read where they were trying to tell her that socialism is shirk capitalism is shirk they, they they are against islam and just of them but one one point that i've given to me that if you ask that brother so that what is the response of government he will now be telling you the future of socialism so i've taken that one alhamdulillah Secondly, here in Nigeria, there is one bad culture. And unfortunately, the Christian, they have identified that culture with Islam. Whereas, it's not in Islam. What is that culture? It's the culture of begging. You know, in the northern part of the country, we have some people, the outside, they are all over Nigeria. There's no any state or any local government in Nigeria you go you will not see these beggars. They have taken this uh, 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 begging, they have taken it as a profession, they have taken it as something that they must do. You understand? Anywhere in Nigeria, when you go, you see them. This now creates a kind of image in the brain of non-Muslim that Islam is a religion that encourages begging. So, and then it's going to be very difficult to erase this mentality from those who are doing it and but for the christian it's very simple because when they meet such uh, people like us or maybe we give a lecture on it where islam goes against begging for example you know there are certain ideas of the prophet that is the prophet say well well that is the prophet so by the time I uh, we give lecture on such as these people will not be surprised that these people we are they, even though it was an issue in Nigeria it it, it became a topical issue in Nigeria uh, about four years or five years ago, which in our legislative room 
uh, our the one of the one of the senators, I think, uh, speak uh, uh, Senate President David Mack said that uh, he has he has contacted the Sharia man, that is the governor of San Fara, who introduced Sharia. He has contacted him that this begging begging is in Islam. Then the man replied, "No, it was not part of Islam." So, what you are trying to do that is to encourage people to work instead of begging. So uh, that is the problem. I don't know that problem. I don't know how it can be solved uh, in Nigeria because if you go to any local government, every state, every local government, you see my brother there doing begging. Even though they didn't give him bed, say so who asked you to be given bed? Eh? You should stop giving bed so that this thing can be eradicated completely. So that is the situation in Nigeria. So I'll handle the lie. So the little one that we can do, we are doing it. You understand? So thank you very much for the lecture. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your comments. And it's a very, very important topic about begging. Uh, Brother Rafiq also is uh, saying thank you for taking us through the nuances of the nexus between an individual and the government. Uh, interesting observation that the more the government takes care of the people, the lesser will be the social and community connections. Absolutely. So uh, a lot of times the result of government programs is exactly the problem uh, that you have mentioned in Nigeria and other places is the problem of begging. People uh, learn to be dependent rather than independent. And even though, as you correctly pointed out, the Prophet continuously وسلم, taught people, taught Muslims, taught the community to always be independent. Unfortunately, when you assume that it's the government's job to take care of you, you then set yourself up for becoming dependent on the government. And then uh, when there are poor people, whether it's you or others, uh, they uh, are expecting uh, that instead of the community taking care of you, that they claim uh, that it is the government that should take care of you, which is uh, very, very problematic, like we pointed out. Uh, when all of us are facing our Lord on the Day of Judgment, and Allah asks you, did you have uh, neighbors or family members who were uh, in need? And you say yes, and Allah says, what did you do about it? And you say, well, it's the government's problem, not my problem. Allah will say no. It is your problem. It is your responsibility. And as Rafiq is saying, Islam instructs us to re rehabilitate criminals by utilizing them productively. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, yes, a very important part because a lot of times people become criminals, uh, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, the, uh, uh, the reason is they don't have jobs or they don't have uh, legal jobs. Uh, the government prevents them from having certain jobs and so it becomes a problem and they become criminals then when they come out of jail they have no job and they have to uh, cheat or uh, beg or uh, engage in other uh, non-productive activities okay so thank you very much all of you for sharing for commenting uh, and for participating uh, and i look forward to your research papers uh, inshallah uh, and I'm very glad uh, that you have been able to uh, continue in this class for all these uh, many sessions uh, and hopefully in the next two sessions as well. Uh, and we hope that you uh, tell other people about uh, what you are learning and share the knowledge. Uh, and we uh, continue uh, to uh, in welcome and invite uh, more and more students into IKI Academy uh, as a result of your efforts as well and your uh, spreading of the information. Uh, may Allah bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, have a very blessed uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and may Allah uh, give you uh, success. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you, Professor Sakhar. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam.